Hello. So I enjoy the opportunity to uh, wrap up the conversation today. I was glad to be here today, get a chance to meet some of you, and hear the information that our panel of speakers provided. This is similar to how we structure our own educational seminars. I'm from the Pennsylvania area, Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton area, and we always try to follow the technical, clinical information with what we call the other part of cancer care, the psychosocial aspect. So our goals for this portion of today will be to, uh, first, I want to introduce the cancer support community as an organization to you, and then also give a nod to our sister organization, Hope Connections. Some of you might be familiar with that group in Bethesda, Maryland. They had been a part of our network, and they really, like I said, our sister organization to us, they're doing similar similar work with high standards of, of care. So uh, this is the similar information that I share, I think, could really apply to them as well. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about distress that's common after a cancer diagnosis and through treatment, and then talk about how to sensitively talk to one another, get support, seek out resources, and and help each other cope. And through that, I was tempted to arrange us all in a circle. That's really more of the format that I'm used to in working with support groups. But in recognizing that not everybody would be comfortable entirely doing that, although you really seem like a very um, advocating group and, and comfortable group. But I thought what we would do instead, at certain points during this short presentation, I'll give some time to have you reflect on some questions. You'll notice on your tables you have pens and some pads of paper. So I would invite you, it's just a request, not a must, but I'd invite you to give some thought. And then if you're interested, after the PowerPoint, we can then kind of turn this into a discussion. The the role that I take as a program director and a facilitator in groups is that I'm not necessarily the expert every time. Our belief is that the expertise lies with you guys. You hold that. You are the experts in your own care and in your own experience. So as Grace mentioned earlier, that would be, uh, there would be time given to that at the end. So briefly to introduce Cancer Support Community, we are as an organization about 30 years old. We started in California as the wellness community. Uh, we have a Dr. Benjamin, different than the one we heard from today, but we have a Dr. Benjamin who was our founder. His wife had cancer, and he found that her medical treatment was adequate, but the part that was missing was the psychosocial piece. And some of you might remember Gilda Radner from the original Saturday Night Live crew. She had attended the Santa Monica affiliate, and uh, it was her dream to have a similar organization on the East Coast, and they named their organization in New York City where it started, Gilda's Club, because something that we were told Gilda would often say is that she didn't ask for membership in this club. This wasn't a club that she thought she was going to join or wanted to join, but she really approached it with humor, with camaraderie, and with support. And so we had called ourselves the wellness community. Their group called themselves Gilda's Club, but we went through a merger in 09 and thus became the cancer support community. Our mission is to ensure that all people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, again, something that Beacon and all of you, by coming here today, are doing, advocating for yourselves. We don't use the word cancer victim. We say survivor, uh, victor, someone who is taking an active stance in their care. Strengthened by action, again, not, not a passive role, but taking more of an active stance, and sustained by community, helping one another, reaching out. The patient active concept is really a belief that is interwoven between, through all of our programs, and basically that speaks to the fact that if you take an active stance in your care, if you partner with the doctors, with the social workers, with the nurse navigators, with the surgeons, you are going to increase your quality of life because you'll be more informed and hopefully through that uh, decrease your level of stress. And that, in turn, we hope will enhance the possibility of recovery. Just some examples of the programs that we offer, all of which are free to people who have been affected by cancer. Um, all of us across the network have weekly support groups for both family members and the person going through cancer treatment. We do have d diagnosis-specific groups. Again, I believe that the, the affiliate uh, in Philadelphia and Delaware I think they've had bladder cancer groups as well, but definitely Hope Connections. I understand they meet on the third Thursday of each month. 
We offer online programs as well if you're living in an area where there is not a branch. Nutrition and exercise programs have been very, very popular, especially at our site. We have Ask the Doctor Nights, different uh, stress reduction, mind, body, spirit programs that would include yoga, tai chi, journaling, art therapy, and again, some other more cancer-specific education seminars. So why organizations like us are here? It's because we know that cancer can cause distress. And that's, that term, distress, really refers to any hardship that puts a strain on all aspects of our life, how we feel, how we think, how we act, what we believe. So it's the whole spectrum of feelings, anything from sadness, fear, anger, frustration, to more severe signs of depression, panic, and debilitating anxiety. It's actually the most underreported side effect to cancer. Does that surprise you? Why do you think? Is there still a stigma to talk about the emotional reactions? I often hear, uh, not only from my own family, but uh, from our group members, especially the caregivers, will say, you know, well, my husband went into the doctor. The doctor said, how you doing? What do you think he said? Fine. Or if it was something beyond fine, Oftentimes, it's the physical symptoms that are talked about first, which that makes sense, and those are very important, and oftentimes they are the priority to address. But I hear about the family members and the friends that go with them, poking them and saying, wait, 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 wait. you're scared about this, you're afraid about this, you're, you're not yourself, you're pulling away, um, you don't have interest in the hobbies that you used to do. So that value in, in having someone go with you to an appointment I think, safeguards against that, that you can uh, get to the reality of the situation and kind of bring it full circle so that really the doctors that you're seeing can really get back to treating the whole person, which would include the distress symptoms, the emotional side. Also, other symptoms of distress, fatigue, changes in sleep patterns, changes in eating patterns, decreased libido, which we'll talk about in a little bit later. And all of these symptoms are a real concern because they decrease your quality of life. So this is the first writing activity that I'll invite you to, to think about. And if you don't care to write it, I would invite you to just think about it and, and reflect on it. To list your main sources of stress. Any stressor that was there before cancer may, in fact, be compounded now after a diagnosis and everything that you're going through. Are the sources for stress on the physical side? Are they on the emotional side? So take a minute to reflect on that. And as you're doing that, I'll cover the stages during the cancer experience when distress symptoms are most likely. Of course, at the diagnosis. A diagnosis of cancer has been compared to a traumatic event. Dr. Benjamin earlier today, do you remember when he referred to that? He talked about how oftentimes that first appointment, the words just become a mumble, and the, the patient's missing most of it. That's a really common defense that our mind does for us to protect us from troubling information. It's overwhelming. At the point of diagnosis, some of the stress could also be about you wondering how you're going to tell your coworkers, how you're going to talk to your family, how you're going to approach this. Uh, we had a volunteer, a longtime volunteer, had a prominent job in the Lehigh Valley. When she was diagnosed with cancer, she told no one. Her husband obviously knew. Her children at the time knew. She told no one else. So stories like that are especially troubling for me to hear as a counselor because I think, wow, she was facing this pretty much alone. But it was so stressful to her that the way she explained it was she needed that sense of normalcy. But she realized after that that decision to keep the secret and not talk about it prevented her from getting the help she needed. And... Uh, she now is a very big advocate for what we do and talking in support groups. Another stage during the cancer experience where we see a lot of distress symptoms are right at the beginning of treatment or prior to major surgery because of all the decisions uh, that are to be made. 
all morning I was, I was listening along with you about all the treatment options and the statistics. Reviewing that and deciding what is going to make most sense for you all can cause a great deal of distress. Also, once treatment starts, managing the side effects can be very difficult. Um, the doctors talked about the impact on the lymphatic system. I know that in, in our groups, we hear that as such a main source of stress, the risk of lymphedema, and managing that. Also, this one I think might surprise others who haven't had a, a close experience with cancer, but another stage where this is very likely is at the end of treatment. I hear quite a bit from members who, in our groups who've finished treatment. Their family says, all right, you're done. You're great. Okay, you're back to work, or you know, you're, you're back on the team. Okay, it's over. It's behind you. How many of you, when you think about that, would say that it's behind you, that it's over, that you're fine? This experience changes you, uh, possibly because there are some longer-term side effects. But even aside from that, this whole experience changes you. We talk about the new normal. Is that a term that any of you have heard? The new normal. What's your life like now after you've been changed? And there's an example that I have, too, with uh, hearing from one of our longtime group members. When she was going through radiation and treatment, she said that she was surrounded by a great team of doctors, compassionate nurses. She was surrounded. There was someone who was actively watching her cancer. So once she graduated, we'll say, in quotes, when she graduated from the radiation, what's next? She said she had such a tough time adapting to the void of, you know, no, one, no one's tracking my cancer now. And there is this distance she felt between some of her friends and family who really couldn't understand that and didn't know why she didn't bounce back. Also, Dr. Riggs gave the poignant example of the anxiety around scans. So after treatment ends, if it's three months out, six months out, a year out, our members refer to that as scan anxiety, the worry that happens before a scan, kind of that up and down feeling. Also, another stage is that recurrence or metastases, or when there's a change in prognosis. That's another time when we really see the symptoms of distress spike. So how do we cope? Give yourself an outlet that addresses all the dimensions that I mentioned earlier, the cognitive, behavioral, physical, and spiritual. And in doing so, we know that it will decrease hostility and resentment. It's an outlet for anger and frustration. Also, when you continue to talk and find others that have walked a similar walk, the hope is that you'll gain a greater sense of self-confidence, be more assertive, feel more in control during this often chaotic time. You'll have greater expressions of support, hopefully empathy, interest, humor. It's that concept that we, we hope that will be reciprocal. You know, what you put out there, we hope that you'll get back. And if you're honest and you're talking to other people who have been through a similar circumstance, we hope that that support will also come back to you. And what we've learned about that connection, uh, the, the million-dollar word is psychoneuroimmunology. It's the part that you're, it's, it's the uh, connection between your mind, how you, how you, how you think, how you feel, um, translating into your improved physical health and, in turn, psychological functioning. I also want to talk a minute about positive attitude because I hear a lot about this. Being positive doesn't mean that you're happy all the time. Through this experience, those of you who are survivors in the audience, were you happy all the time? I, I hear words of encouragement often and words of motivation coming from good intentions, but people say, oh, attitude is, is, is half the battle. Keep a positive attitude. And where I find that that makes sense, it's, it's an unfair expectation to put on someone. I think that the language that we see in the media about the fight against cancer and the battle, be a warrior. Again, that can be very motivating for some, but there are days that maybe you're too tired, that the fight is really lost underneath the fatigue, and that's okay. You need to give yourself time to heal. You need to give yourself time to ex express and really feel the full range of, of feelings. I'll, I'll tell you now, I'll give the example of my dad. Uh, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 04. 
uh, shortly before I had joined on in the then cam- uh, wellness community. And my dad's very scientific. He's very practical. He's very organized. So when he was diagnosed, this threw him. It fell out of control to him. So I would call, being the good daughter, also the counselor in the family, I would call, and he would just vent. And he would share all these scary statistics. He would tell me what he knew was going to go wrong. And I listened, again, as the good daughter and the good counselor in the family. So he would vent, and it sounded kind of negative, but I could see that it was really about his fear. And then I would ask for my mom, who was, what do you think? A mess. She was crying in response to the negativity that came from him. But what I had to explain, which again was awkward being that these are my parents who, who know so much more than me, but I had to explain to, to her that, you know, that's what dad just needs to do. He's coping like we would expect him to cope. Because once he vented, he felt pretty good. Even though it sounded negative and it didn't land, <laughs> land so nicely on my mom. But... Um, But he started talking, and what I found funny was he had kind of developed this network of of other people who he was put in contact with, and he said, you know what, Jen, there is something to that. I I do feel better when I talk. There is something to that, that group thing. And I said, really? Thanks, Dad. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. You're validating what we are all working so hard to promote and do. An optimistic attitude can improve quality of life. Use humor when it's appropriate. Uh, For my dad, again, what we did to make him laugh, uh, after his surgery to remove his prostate, uh, he had about six to eight weeks where he was home, and he could no longer wear his his Levi jeans that were like a staple on the weekends um, because they were uncomfortable. So to be funny, and this would have only worked coming from family, wouldn't have worked from anybody else, uh, he is absolutely not an Eagles fan. So when I bought sweatpants for him, What do you think I got him? I definitely bought him Eagles (laughs) emblem sweatpants just to kind of, just to get him to laugh, just to be, just to add some some humor. Again, you need to know your audience and you need to use the right timing. It has to be given uh, appropriately. Another final point, I often say, instead of reestablish a sense of hope, I often say redefine a sense of hope. For some, it's a hope for a cure. Others, it's a hope to tolerate treatment well. Others, it's hope to, it's redefined in reaching the next milestone. It's, it ties into developing realistic expectations, planning for short-term goals, planning for long-term goals. So this is where I'd invite you to either write, if you wish, or think about, reflect on, where do you find a sense of hope? What reinforces it, or who reinforces it, Who do you surround yourself by? How do you coach yourself? What's the inner mantra that you say to tap into that optimism and hope? And what are your goals? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Moving along, the next part of my presentation, I wanted to really address the less talked about side effects to cancer, intimacy. I've read in the publications that bladder cancer specifically, uh, the elephant in the room, have you seen that on publications, especially from Beacon and and on the internet, the elephant in the room, and, and I'm wondering why there is such a stigma. I think over the years, possibly the help from celebrities and other awareness campaigns. Now it isn't so embarrassing to wear T-shirts that have all kinds of announcements about breast cancer. We're saying those words more. Lance Armstrong and the Lance Armstrong Foundation campaigns, now we can say the words comfortably testicular cancer. So if we can say those words, can we talk about bladder cancer? Can it be talked about? Can it be brought into into light more? It can be tough to talk about 
and it can be tough to say those words cancer, and it can be even tougher then to talk about some of the other side effects that impact our intimacy and, and sexuality and body image. I thought that Dr. Rasner did a really nice job covering some of the uh, discussion on the physical obstacles to, to intimacy, mentioning the recovery from surgery, not only the healing time, but depending on the extent of the surgery, like she mentioned, there could be other implications. For example, if the prostate was also removed, or for women, if uh, the vaginal wall and other surrounding organs were affected. Also, chemotherapy. We know that chemotherapy drugs attack fast-growing cells. That also includes fast-growing cells that would be hair, so hair loss is often a, a side effect. Also, mucous membranes are fast-growing cells, so that ties into the genital areas as well and could pose a physical obstacle to intimacy and sexuality. Also, again, I think that she did a great job talking a little bit about uh, stomas or ostomy surgery. Pain can be another physical obstacle to intimacy, whether that's pain from bleeding or burning sensations after a surgery or treatment, or also pain in terms of discomfort during healing. Fatigue is what I still hear as the number one uh, side effect, physical side effect to cancer. So that also can pose an obstacle to intimacy. On the other side, the emotional obstacles to intimacy, getting back to body image issues. I hear this from men and from women who talk openly in our groups. Even though they're not necessarily signing up for the program, that's titled Intimacy and Sexuality. Believe me, we are talking about it in support groups. Their self-esteem might go up and down and fluctuate as they face this chronic illness. Again, knowing that signs of distress, depression, and anxiety are often side effects to cancer, the result from, the, from that part of the spectrum and that emotional reaction, but also as a result of some of the medications, some antidepressants, could be a decrease in libido. And when we think of the hierarchy of our needs, you know, what do we need first? Safety, usually. Uh, safety. We need to pay attention to our, our physical health. That's the priority, which, again, makes sense. But it's important to also look at what else we might need. We might need a boost to our self-esteem. We might need to reduce stress. Unfortunately, guilt and blame may still be uh, a, a very significant take a significant impact on someone who's diagnosed, especially if he or she's questioning, you know, why me? How did this happen? Could this have been prevented? It's the, I really think that they're unfair questions. I think it's, it's so much more productive to look at where you're starting here and where can you go forward. But if someone is really faced with that struggle of guilt and blame, that could also get in the way of, of intimacy. Also, the fear of the unknown. This ties into the fear of recurrence. I'm thinking of a couple who had come to our programs for quite a while where uh, the husband had a recurrence, was very scared, wondering what was going to happen, wondering how his wife and his children would handle things. And what he started to do was he started to sleep on the couch, partly because that's where he was most comfortable. But what he started to reveal was that he was starting to detach because he thought he was protecting her. So he was sleeping on the couch so that she would get used to being independent. That was his interpretation and, and, and approach. But what do you all think that that did? She would come into the caregiver group and share how, how she just wanted to be close to him. So that protection actually was, was counterproductive. She wanted to be around him as much as possible. And they needed to really talk that out. So if body image issues are something that you're struggling with, I just wanted to give an example of a more cognitive behavioral approach to changing that self-talk, that inner dialogue that we can kind of have sometimes. Listing three negative thoughts related to your sexuality, your body image, and then replace those. This is quite simple. Replace each negative thought with a positive thought to counterbalance that self-talk. So for example, usually these negative self-talk messages are more general. They're not always realistic. It's based on a fear that you might have. So what I might hear is, I'm, not, I'm no longer attractive. 
Everything is ruined. I'm no longer attractive. So if that's the mental self-talk, imagine what that person will convey to a partner, to someone who he or she used to be intimate with. So in this cognitive behavioral reframing, changing that to only one part of my appearance has changed, but it doesn't define me. So just little tricks like that to just counteract some of the negativity that you might face while you're stressed out, while you're feeling more vulnerable. Also, there are some ways to explore, to redefine how you might express your sexuality, discover new ways that don't involve intercourse, more gentle massage, more attention to other parts of the body. There are sex therapists that can really be helpful in talking to partners about trying a new sexual position, maybe on your side, in a position where the, uh, the device, the pouch, won't come between you and your partner, a position where um, getting back to more of the, the mental side, emotional side, a position that might, where you might feel more comfortable and more confident. But really, I keep coming back to intimacy as far as communication. It's so important to talk to your loved ones, to talk this through, talk about what interests you, what you need, it, when and where you're most comfortable with touch, how you might redefine that together so that misunderstandings don't happen. So again, this is the last little writing activity to think about what questions or concerns do you have? What do you need as far as affection, as far as intimacy, as far as communication? What could be changed? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Using that maybe as a prompt to come back to later if you wish. So finally, the idea of self-care... It sounds so simple, but during stressful times, especially stressful medical times, we often need reminders of some of these basics to take care of ourselves. And this goes for the person living with cancer as well as the caregivers, friends, and family as well. Good nutrition, staying hydrated, tending to what you normally need to do for your body for overall health, rest, maximizing the times during the day where you have more energy after treatment and throughout treatment, using relaxation skills. Uh, how many of you participate in meditation or self-hypnosis or yoga and tai chi? Some tools to relax, music therapy, art, exercise, gentle movement, and again, finding support, whether that's in a group that meets face-to-face -face or a group that might meet online. I listed some resources here, but I had come back to this to think of a few others I wanted to mention. Uh, the Cancer Support Community, to start, is a global network. We're all across the country at various locations, as well as into Canada. And we do have online support groups, too. And I wanted to mention, I know that Grace had them up front. We call them our Frankly Speaking About series. And the publications that we had here, I hope some of you had a chance to, to look them through and pick some of them up, addressing uh, financial concerns. That booklet is called The Cost of Care. Uh, side Effects Management is one of the other books, and Tips for Caregivers. The American Cancer Society has a lot of wonderful publications as well that you can download and print out, or you can have them mailed in, in more of a bound uh, document. But as far as how to talk to young kids about cancer, how to approach work, how to get the help that you need in, in communicating and asking for help. They also have a program, Look Good, Feel Better. Are any of you aware of that program? It's a skin and makeup care class for women. And we host it at our site once a month, and we always hear lots of laughter coming from those women. So again, it refers back to that body image issue. Uh, I included BCAN, obviously. Uh, looks like many of you are, also, are already participating in some of the great things that BCAN has to offer. 
I also included Convitec. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this company. This was not to give any in endorsement necessarily. It's just that I found that they have really helpful materials on that you can access through their website about lifestyle changes after a stoma or ostomy. And it's, uh, it's called Great Comebacks. This is a DVD and a booklet that goes along with it. Um, and it's, it's, it was done by a, a colon cancer survivor, but I'm wondering if some of the information on that Great Comebacks video could parallel what a bladder cancer survivor is going through as well. Also, uh, the United Ostomy Association of America, the website is www.ostomy.org. They have a great publication referring back to the myths and the facts about intimacy and sexuality after certain surgeries. Uh, I know in our area we have a very active wound ostomy nurse association. So look, doing a search to find out what's in your area or talking to those nurses that might be at your hospitals, the Wound Ostomy Continence Nurse Association. Also, for those of you who are looking for more of a one-on-one -on -one counselor, um, if it's to address the intimacy sexuality topics, there's an organization called ASECT. It's A A. S-E-C-T. It's an accreditation for uh, sex educators and therapists. Or if you're searching generally for counselors, it, you might have trouble finding one that says specifically that he or she sees uh, people who are facing cancer. That might be very specific. That might not come up in their short bio. So instead, what I suggest is to look for someone who focuses on lifespan issues, um, managing chronic illness, and definitely trauma and recovery. Again, com you know, comparing the diagnosis and facing the treatment to a crisis and a, and a trauma dealing with the anxiety. So searching on the National Association for Social Workers and American Psychological Association and the National Board Certified Counselors to try to find someone in your area that you think might be a good fit.